Well, turn in your Bibles, uh, please, to John chapter 6. This chapter, John chapter 6, is a, is a story of mass defection. Uh, John chapter 6 describes why people come to church and why they do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And John chapter 6 describes why people eventually defect after following Jesus and why they end up giving up on church. We started this message last Sunday and we called it Why False Disciples Come to Church. And you can watch that on the website if you missed it. There were 5,000 men, plus women, plus children, at the beginning of this chapter, John chapter 6. This is the story where Jesus fed uh, 20,000 people with five little loaves and a couple of fish. I mean, can you imagine the fidelity of Jesus' voice traveling across a crowd of 20 thousand people without any electronic amplification and yet at the end of this chapter verse 60 is this amazing verse many of his disciples that's disciples with a small d a lowercase d they're following jesus they're learning from jesus they're students of jesus they're called disciples but they're not true believers. And it says, when many of his disciples uh, heard Jesus' sermon, they began to say to each other, who can listen to this? In other words, they're saying, I can't stand listening to this anymore. There's a hostile tone to their question. And then Jesus says in verse 64, there are some of you who do not believe. So these people were disciples. They're followers. They're professors of Jesus on some level. But Jesus says, in your heart, you really don't believe. And then verse 66, what eventually happens to disciples who don't really believe, it says this, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Mass defection. Well, there are people who come to church who say they believe, and they really don't. They're false disciples. It was false disciples in Jesus' day, and so it ought not to be any surprise that there are false disciples today. And John chapter 6 gives us eight characteristics, eight marks of a false disciple disciple. And we started this last week, so we'll continue on and march a little bit further through it today. It's a long chapter. We're not going to get through it all this morning, but we'll inch our way forward and get through a little bit more today. So just to help out those of you who weren't here last week, or maybe if you need a little bit of reminder, uh, let me just uh, review what we covered last week. We saw last week that the first reason that false disciples come to church is because of the crowd. If you go back to the top of chapter 6, right in verse 1, that's very clear. That's why a lot of people were following Jesus. It says this, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was coming toward him. Well, that's why a lot of people were attracted to Jesus, because of the crowd. A crowd attracts a crowd. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with coming to church because you saw a crowd. A lot of people end up in church because there was a crowd going and they went out of curiosity and they met the Lord Jesus Christ in that condition. And that's a wonderful thing. But a crowd is not a good enduring reason for staying at church. It's a good reason to come to church, but it's not a good reason to stay at church. But that's the first reason why a lot of people follow Jesus, because they saw the crowd and they were following the crowd. Here's the second reason why false disciples come to church. False disciples come to church looking for the sensational. Look what it says. They saw the signs that Jesus was doing on the sick. So some people come to church 
merely, purely, for no other reason than because of the sensationalism of the promise of seeing some spectacular supernatural events happening. They're, they're looking and hoping and searching for some sensational experience. Now you drop down to verse 14 and you see the third reason why false disciples follow Jesus and come to church. Some people come to church because of the crowd. Some people come to church because they're looking for the sensational. But here's the third reason. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who was to come into the world. Well, so far so good. He's not a prophet. He's much more than a prophet, but at least they're recognizing that he's someone very special. So far so good. Look at verse 15. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force, whoops, to make him king. Well, you never make someone king who is king, who deserves to be king. You never force him to be king by force. And here's the next reason why false disciples come to church. Some people follow Jesus. Some people come to church because they have man-centered agendas. False disciples came to Jesus because of the crowd. Some of them came because they were seeking the sensational. And evidently here, they came to Jesus because they had their own opinion about what they wanted to do with Jesus. They had their own man-centered agendas. Well, that's why some people come to church. They're not interested in God's will. They're not interested in what Jesus wants to do with their life. They have their own man-centered opinions and agendas about what church ought to be. They're not interested in God's agenda. Interested only in their own. They have decided to make him king. It never occurs to them to ask the king what he might want. And that's also the way a lot of people approach the Bible, by the way, from a man-centered starting point. They, they make demands and impose expectations on the Bible. They come to the Bible wanting God to speak and act in a way that suits their opinion. They define fairness and justice by their own standard rather than by God's standard. Whereas a God-centered starting point simply lets God be God and allows God to define what is holy and right and fair and just and simply believes and accepts and submits to God as God is presented in the Bible. False disciples start with their own opinion about what the Bible ought to be. You cannot understand the Bible if you begin with human opinions. The only way you can understand the Bible is to come to the Bible with a God-centered position and allow God to speak for himself. Well, that's as far as we got last week. So let's move her forward a little bit. It says now in verse 15, so Jesus went away by himself. This is right after the crowd wants to coronate Jesus and make him king. Jesus goes away by himself. He left the disciples, the 12 disciples, behind. Now look at verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Verse 17. They got into a boat and they started across the sea to Capernaum. Now these boats were a very common sight around the shoreline of Galilee in those days. In 1986, they found one of these fishing boats around the northwest shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. And they have it on display there in a, in a museum. I saw it when we visited there in 2011. It wasn't very big, it wasn't very deep, and it had no enclosed cabin. It was just a little open, kind of like a long, narrow rowboat, 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, uh, about the length of 
maybe two and a half pews that you're sitting on. Just about big enough to accommodate 12 big burly fishermen types on a calm night on the Sea of Galilee. And now it's dark, the text says, and Jesus had not yet come to them. So they set out across the water for a, a nighttime crossing. Now these men are a bit bewildered here, you got to understand. They don't really understand what's happening right now. They have just come off the greatest rush in their lives. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be there that day on that mountainside sitting on the grass with 20,000 people and feeding those 20,000 people with five loaves and two fish and to have it spread over all 20,000. And then the crowd is so amazed at Jesus that they want to make him king. I mean, if you were one of those 12 disciples, I mean, what a rush to be riding shotgun and such an extraordinary event. Jesus is now the most popular game in town. Everybody's talking about him. Everybody loves him. And the 12 disciples are right in on that movement. But then Jesus disappeared, mysteriously, without explanation. And he left the twelve of them behind. And now it's getting dark, and they don't know where he went. And so they set off across the lake to go to the other side, not really knowing why they were going, where they were going. <clears throat> Just something to do. Verse 18. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. This is quite a switch from the afternoon. I mean, a pleasant picnic on the side of the mountain, sitting on lush green grass. And now, 12 hours later, they're in the middle of the lake, in the middle of a storm. That's the way life is sometimes, isn't it? Calm one minute, chaos the next. James chapter 1 says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into various trials. That little word fall into is an interesting little word. It means to stumble into without warning. It, it means to trip over. And that's the way problems come, isn't it? We don't get advance warning on problems. They just come up like a strong wind in a storm in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And then they're, they're in this open boat without Jesus and they're confused and they feel vulnerable and alone. And maybe they even feel let down and abandoned because Jesus hasn't given them any explanation as to where he went. Now look at verse 19. When they had rowed about three or four miles, the Sea of Galilee is actually not a very big lake. I've been on a boat on that lake, and you can easily see all the way across. But these are small boats, and so even a small lake might as well be a big lake in the middle of a storm. I mean, you can drown in a puddle of water. It doesn't take much. And John tells us that they are three or four miles from shore. Now remember, John is a fisherman and John is in that very boat. And so this is a bit of a distance to row, three or four miles. They're far enough from land. And the Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long, north to south, and about 8.1 miles wide at its widest point. So when John says they have rowed three or four miles, he's letting us know that they are right smack dab in the middle of the lake. And John, this fisherman by trade, knows distances from land very well. And then it says, John gives us this, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. Well, that's so like John. They saw Jesus walking on the sea. I mean, John says that like he would say they saw Jesus walking across the parking lot. 
No hyperbole, no melodrama, no added superlatives. Just like Joe Friday, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. They saw Jesus walking on the sea. On water. I mean, who does that? The surface tension of water cannot support the weight and the shape of a human body. I mean, a feather or a leaf can float on the surface tension of water, but not a human body. A kindergarten student knows that. But that night, Jesus defied the laws of physics. He suspended the laws of gravity. Now, how did he do that? Well, Colossians 1 says that all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus and in Jesus all things hold together. Jesus holds every molecule of the universe together. He is preventing the entire universe from exploding or imploding. Holds it all together. So if Jesus holds every molecule of the universe together, walking on water is no problem. In fact, walking on water proves the fidelity of Colossians chapter 1. Now remember, John is in the boat. So he's an eyewitness to this event. He's not getting this account second hand. He's giving a first hand account of something he saw with his own eyes along with another 11 disciples who were in the boat with them. They also eyewitnessed this. Now skeptics will say, well, how do you know that really happened? Well, 12 eyewitnesses claim that they saw it. I mean, if John was making this up, why would the other 11 disciples not blow the whistle and say, this is fake news? They didn't because it wasn't. There's no evidence anywhere from antiquity of anybody denying this event. And they were frightened. It says right in the text, they were frightened. This is not the kind of description you would expect if this was a fabricated story. I mean, if this was a made-up story, why portray the man in the boat as weak and timid and anemic? What would be the point? John's a fisherman. Why would John put himself in such an unfavorable light? It doesn't make any sense. If you go over to Matthew, Matthew's account of this story, and he was in the boat as well, by the way, he tells us that they thought that he was a ghost out on the water. Matthew 14, 26 says this, But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, and they said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Well, that's exactly what you would expect because that's exactly what we would think if a shadowy figure showed up in the middle of the night walking on the water on a dark night in a storm, especially if that said figure is moving towards you. You would be terrified. The other night, Belinda woke me up in the middle of the night in the dark. And she said in a loud whisper, Somebody's at the side of the house. <laughs> and then she said, I heard a pile of logs falling. Go see who it is. <laughs> so I said to her, <laughs> You go see who it is. <laughs> so naturally I had to get up and go see and I walked past the dog who was still fast asleep and I said to her, fat lot of good you are. <laughs> I looked out the window and it was our friendly neighborhood fat raccoon. <laughs> well, dark is frightening. It's dark, the sea is rough, there's a strong wind. They're in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the lake, in a shallow boat that's loaded to capacity and it's floating low in the water and they've been rowing for hours and Jesus is gone and now there's a figure out there in the dark hovering on top of the water and it's coming toward them. That would be enough to make some of them jump into the sea. Look at verse 20. 
But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. That's so like Jesus. What a wonderful word of comfort and assurance from our Lord. It's okay. It's me. Don't be scared. It reminds you of Jesus' words in John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? You believe in God? You believe in God? You can also believe in me. What a statement of the deity of Jesus. Believing in God is the same thing as believing in me. What a great example of Jesus' strength and comfort to the human heart. What a great thing to have somebody in your life who can say that to you when you're in the dark, when you're in the storm. It's okay. It's only me. Don't be scared. Don't cry. It's going to be okay. See, this is what you get when you know Jesus. Jesus said, don't worry about your life. Your heavenly Father knows what you're worried about. He knows everything that you need. You don't need to worry. In John 14, he said, My peace I'll give to you, and I'm going to give you a peace that the world knows nothing about. I'm going to give you a peace that you can experience even when your world is in chaos. It's a supernatural peace. Matthew 11, he said, come on to me. Anybody who's been working really hard and you're really tired and you're really burdened, just come to me and I'll give you rest. You see, the ability to lift burdens and to grant peace and to ease fear, even in the storm, is one of the great ministries of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so once they realize it's Jesus, look at verse 21 says, Then they were glad to take him into the boat. <laughs> you think? You bet they're glad. Their heart goes from fear to faith, from terror to gladness. The presence of Jesus can do that. It can turn darkness into day. He's the light of the world. And whenever there's a light in the darkness, there's always hope. But there's something else they did that Matthew records that John doesn't record talking about the same event. Matthew 14, 32. When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And verse 33, those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. There's a fantastic definition of worship. This is what the crowd should have been doing that day at the end of that picnic. Worshipping. Instead of Forcing their will and their demands and their expectations on Jesus by planning a coronation ceremony. They should have dropped to their knees and buried their face in the ground and worshipped him as the Christ, the Son of God. The disciples in the boat got it right. Because they're not fake disciples. They are the real McCoy. They, they understand how to worship. Now, this reveals another reason why false disciples come to church. Or rather, what they don't come for. False disciples don't come for true worship. False disciples are not astonished 
to be in the presence of the living Christ. False disciples are not filled with reverence for Christ. False disciples don't love Christ. False disciples don't believe that Christ is God in a physical body. False disciples don't love to hear the scriptures taught and read. False disciples don't care about theology. False disciples don't love prayer because they don't come for true worship. False disciples come for the crowd. They come for the sensational. They come with self-centered uh, agendas and opinions. And they don't come to worship. True worship is a right response to a right understanding of who Christ is. It's that simple. That's what happened in the boat that night. They finally understood who Jesus was. As he stepped into that boat and calmed the storm, they finally understood who he was. The Christ, the Son of the living God. And that right understanding simply produced an unavoidable response. They dropped to their knees in worship. Worship styles are a big thing in church these days. A lot of people would say they go to a particular church because of the worship. And it's often caused me to ask the question, what does that mean? What do they mean they go because of the worship? I suppose what they mean is we like the worship style. I think that's probably what's meant. But that then leads me to another question. How do you measure qualitative worship? How do you measure real worship? You ask some people, what do you mean you go because of the worship? How do you know that is real worship? And some will say, well, because of the size of the crowd, how could it not be? There's thousands of people come here. This must be real worship. <coughs> Others might say, well, I like the volume of the music. The music is really loud, so it must be real worship. Uh, some will say, well, because of the excitement of the music. I, I love the excitement and the energy of the music, and that's what makes the worship real. Some will say, I, I like the atmosphere. It's an, atmos it's a, it, it's an atmosphere of worship. I've never really understood what that meant. I've heard worship leaders say in the midst of a worship service when things get really quiet, the Holy Spirit has just showed up, which causes me to suspect then, okay, so when the atmosphere is quiet, that's when the Holy Spirit is here? Actually, in the scriptures when the Holy Spirit showed up, it was usually the opposite. But who decides that all of those things make real worship? So, some will say, well, it, 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 it makes me feel good. This worship makes me feel good, so it must be real worship. So then, real worship is, is experiential, how it makes you feel. Let's get down to the nub of things. How do you measure real worship? Worship is a right response to a right understanding of the living Christ. It's that simple. The disciples realized who was in the boat in their midst, and they, they had no choice. Once they understood they were in the presence of magnificence, they were in the presence of majesty. They were in the presence of holiness. They were in the presence of a supreme power that controlled the elements in calm storms. Their, their, their human heart had no other choice but to bow in reverential worship. 
There is no other kind of worship that's real. Peter loved Christ. Listen to what he said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne by him by the majestic glory. These are incredible words. This is my beloved son. Peter is describing, of course, his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. With whom I am well pleased. Verse 18. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter loved Christ because Peter saw his power and his honor and his glory and his majesty. A right understanding of Jesus will always lead to an automatic right response of worship. And maybe you're thinking, well, it's easy for Peter to say that. He was on the mountain with Jesus when that happened and he walked with him for three years in physical bodily form so much easier for Peter than for us well listen to what Peter says next verse 19 and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed more fully confirmed by the prophetic word we understand more of the majesty of Christ from the scriptures than Peter did from being with Jesus in physical bodily form. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us illuminating the scriptures, exciting our hearts to the scriptures and the revelation of Christ in the scriptures, you get a better understanding of the magnificence of Christ from the Holy Spirit illuminating Jesus in Scripture than Peter ever did when he walked alongside Jesus. In fact, for three years when, Jesus, when Peter walked alongside Jesus, Peter just constantly never got it. Peter didn't get it until a few days before Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was illuminating Peter's mind to understand the Scriptures, and Peter finally understood why Judas did what he did. Because it was prophesied in the Old Testament, and Peter all of a sudden becomes an Old Testament scholar because he finally understands passages that he had read as a kid growing up that he never understood and the Holy Spirit began to illuminate his mind and he began to understand scripture and he began to see Christ all over the Old Testament and that is what produced Peter's maturity we love Christ Jesus told a parable of the pearl of great price followed by a man who discovers a treasure in a field. The guy who discovers a treasure in a field stumbled over it quite by accident. The other fellow discovered the pearl and went away and sold all, of the, all that he had in order to buy it. Jesus is telling us that he is the pearl of great price. He is the treasure that the guy tripped over. So whether you've been searching for Christ for a long time, like the guy who sold all he had to get the pearl, or whether you were like the farmer who just one day you were going through your life and you tripped over him, he's the most amazing, most magnificent thing you have ever found in your life. We get up every Sunday morning to gather here to lift up his name and to tell him how much we love him. We read the Bible every day to discover more about him. And the more we discover, the more amazed we are by his majesty. And the more we want to please him every day with our words and our actions and our thoughts and our motives. When you have a right vision of Christ, you just cannot help but worship. That's our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ.
This is who we worship. This is why we come to church. Because of Christ. Well, there's a few more reasons, so let's stop there and we'll pick it up next time and maybe finish John chapter 6 next Sunday. How about that? Let's pray. Father, again we thank You for the gift of Christ. We thank You for the gift of Scripture which reveals Christ. We would not know Him were it not for the Word of God. Thank You for the story, for the completeness, the richness of it all. What a treasure. We bless Your name, Lord. We worship You with thanksgiving. We thank You for what You have given us in Christ. May we love Him more supremely. May He be our all in all. Lord, if there is one person here today who does not know Christ, please draw them to Yourself. Enable them to believe and to trust Christ in Christ's strong and wonderful, majestic, magnificent name we pray. Amen.
just wanted him to have his way in us. Edgar did an excellent Bible study last Wednesday night on the little book of Jude. Let me close with the doxology of that little book. Now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen and amen.